So, hello everyone. Nice that you're joining here instead of enjoying the nice weather outside. Anyone an idea what's laying around here on this picture? Shout. Ram indeed. Other things? So it's all kinds of chips basically. Um, anyone an idea what my company ASML is doing with chips? So we basically create the machines that the big chip manufacturers like Intel and TSMC and Samsung uh, use to produce their chips. So actually, probably all of you have a phone and a laptop, right? Otherwise, you're probably lost here anyway. Um, there is a big probability that those chips are created on one of our machines. So we're uh, a company from the Netherlands, and I joined them about two years ago, and I, I don't want to do any sales or something, but I learned quite a bit on how chips are physically created and what the role of software is in that process. And I thought it would be interesting to actually share with other people as well. So in this talk, I'll explain how those chips are created and then give an example project. Basically, the project I'm working on is a software architect. Um, but let's see that later. What's this? Silicon wafer. And what's on the wafer? Yeah, mostly I present at Java conference. This is the Java mascot, the Duke, basically. Uh, so this is basically what, we, what, what our customers do. They have these wafers and they print chips on top of it, basically. Um, and to do that, you need a lot of transistors. Transistors typically have a drain, a gate, and a source. And it's a bit like a water tap. So water flows in, you have something to control it, and then some amount flows out. It's the same for a transistor, but then with electricity instead of water, because else you damage them. Um, probably a lot of you have heard of Moore's Law. There are different explanations, some easier, some more difficult. I guess the most easy one is that the number of transistors on a chip doubles every two years. Which is quite insane, right, if you think about it. Like, which other industry do they double things every two years? Cars aren't getting twice as fast every two years. Buildings aren't getting twice as fast every two years. But with chips, we're doing this since the 70s, basically. So it's, it's insane how quick uh, this goes. And then, basically, we, uh, yeah, we create these transistors on a really small scale. And small, yeah, it's off for me when I started, it was really difficult to comprehend, but one million nanometers is one millimeter. I mean, for me, understanding stops at one millimeter, basically. Uh, so how big do you think transistors are nowadays? I put some numbers of different things here. Any idea? Five, yeah, between five and 10, somewhere around that range, depends a bit on who you ask and who, how well the marketing is going, uh, but it's, it's really small. Uh, and it all starts with this, silica sand. It's sand that's there in abundance. It's not a rare earth metal. It's actually used for golf courses. So once you see people digging up golf courses, then probably we ran out of it. Uh, but for now, it doesn't look like that. That's melted really hot. And then they create things like this out of it. We call that an ingot. And it has this weird shape because they basically pull it out of the molten uh, sand. That ingot is sliced, and then you get wafers, typically in uh, factories uh, for our customers. We don't transport them manually. We put them in this, this is called the uh, front of uh, opening universal pot. There are 20 in them, uh, and those are then used to create chips. Uh, so what's that wafer? Uh, so some statistics. Uh, on a wafer, you can have about 200 layers, depending on what kind of chip you make. So if it's a memory chip or a compute chip, uh, we can have about 600 chips per wafer. Again, depends on which type of chip. Um, we can have 130 million transistors per square meter. I mean, that's pretty insane, right? To imagine, uh, to do things on such a small scale. And it's basically a bit like 3D printing. So on top of that wafer, we sort of do 3D printing. You've probably seen uh, one of these devices in action before. It creates line on top of the line, and then we continue. Uh, except we do it a bit more precise. And um, to give that in like real world numbers, Imagine that you drive a car for 300 kilometers across this line. You turn around and drive back for 300 kilometers. And in th that entire process, you deviate less than two millimeters. That's the accuracy with which we print lines on top of each other. So it's a bit better than your average 3D printer. So if you have that wafer, first some chemicals are put on, on top of it. Uh, so we call that coating. And then we go to the next phase. Uh, and that's this. This is a, a lithography machine. So this is one of the machines that we uh, create. Um, it, it's huge. And with every generation, they get even bigger. 
Uh, now one of these machines requires uh, three fully loaded Boeing 747s to transport, uh, so it's, it's pretty big and with a lot of different parts. Um, inside that machine we have uh, the wafers, and they're actually they're not clamped or something, they are magnetically levitating on that wafer table as we call it. Because if we clamp it, it would bend and it would result in uh, less good chips basically. So we do a lot of weird stuff to make more fully working chips. And then what happens is here, so here the chemicals are on top of it, and then we somehow need to create a pattern on top of, uh, or inside those chemicals. So let's see how that goes. So this uh, looks quite magical, like something from Star Wars or something, but what actually is happening is uh, there is a laser amplifier, and actually the big machine that you saw doesn't even include the laser amplifier, it's in the basement, it's another big machine. It amplifies the laser to 30 kilowatts, then the laser beam travels for 30 meters, and it hits a droplet of tin, which is traveling at 70 meters per second. So it hits that droplet of tin, the tin basically becomes a pancake shape, and then the laser hits it again. So that same droplet is hit twice. And that hitting twice happens 50,000 times a second without tin splattering around in the machine. And then basically what happens is that that tin that emits plasma, and from that plasma, EUV light is being emitted. And we need that EUV light basically to print the patterns on top of the chemicals uh, on the wafer. Um, uh, that plasma that gets really hot, so it's about the temperature of the sun, so we also need gases to again cool it down and everything. So there's a, a lot of things going on here, uh, way more complicated than the, the video shows. That was a simplification. And then that light needs to be transported to the right place inside the machine. Uh, we will later see how it looks in the machine, but we use some mirrors for it. But it's not the mirrors that you buy uh, in the store. It's, these are special mirrors with like a hundred different uh, layers of coating, and they're so flat that if you would basically uh, extract them to the size of Germany, the biggest bump would be one millimeter. And we need them to be as flat as possible because else we lose part of the light. Then that light goes uh, up and forth. So basically here we have that uh, light coming out, the EUV light. We have the mirrors, bounces up back and forth. Here we have something which is called a reticle. We come back to that later. It bounces back and forth a bit further. And then in the end here we have the wafer where it will print the pattern. So what's that reticle? It's a bit like a stencil or a template. Maybe you had one of these in the past when you were young with letters in them or something like that. So there were openings in them and in those openings you can draw stuff and that's then on the paper that you had beneath it. Uh, we use more or less the same concept. We have the pattern in uh, such a shape. So the light shines through on certain areas and on certain other areas the light doesn't shine through. Uh, and this looks like this, so it's we call a reticle or a mask. They're a bit more expensive than the templates you had in the past. One of these is about $250,000. Uh, they contain the patterns that are being printed on top of it. So what happens then? So at the top we have that reticle stage with basically the pattern that we want to print, and at the bottom we have the wafer stage. And both of them move at the same time in opposite direction with quite uh, fast speeds, as you can see here. Um, and then they, they create that pattern layer by layer, basically. Uh, so this is how it looks. 
with the reticle, with the pattern that's being created. And this is how it looks in the complete machine. So what you see here is actually we have two of these wafer tables. The first one, we first calibrate the wafer so it's correctly positioned. And then it's switched with the one on the right where we will actually print the pattern. And because we do the calibration first, we can actually do more wafers per hour. We don't need to wait with the calibration. We can do stuff in parallel. Uh, but even when it's being printed, it's still the wafer is being adjusted a lot of times, as you saw in the previous slides, to make sure the position is, is perfectly. And then this, uh, this is the complete machine. So at the top, you see the, the reticle being changed for another reticle. At the bottom, you see the wafers being changed for other wafers and being printed. Um, and at the left, you see wafers coming out of the machine, or coming in and out of the machine. So you see the FOOP here with like 25 wafers, or 20. Uh, schematically, it looks like this. So we begin with that wafer. We put the photoresist on it. Then we have the reticle. We see in some points the light shines through. And then we can decide one of two options. Either we keep the parts where the light has shown on, or we remove those parts. And that we call either positive or negative the photoresist. So that was basically creation of one layer. Uh, before I already explained, you can have up to 200 layers. And this whole circle is then executed 200 times. Oh, so we need to apply that coating, the chemicals. We need to uh, create um, the pattern on it, bake it, etc. So this is a process that can take months to complete. Uh, so we can produce a lot of wafers or layers per hour. But it's every time it's one layer, and then it takes a while before we can print the next layer. So it's not a process that, that goes uh, super quickly. And then you get uh, these things. So basically, this is uh, real chips on, uh, on a wafer. You can see they actually print on, on the edges. So these are basically broken. They don't work. Apparently, this is the most efficient way to produce them. If you use a rectangle, you have more chances that stuff bends and breaks. So they chose to have a circle. Apparently, that's the best way uh, to do it. So let's also look a bit towards uh, the future. So currently, uh, yeah, we already print quite small details, but we want to go smaller and smaller because else uh, we need to fulfill Moore's law. Um, and of course, our customers also want to have faster chips. Um, and, and there are some reasons for it, of course. Uh, the smaller the chip or the transistors that you create, the more transistors you can put on the same area, but also the less power energy they consume. Um, so there are different reasons to have more chips that are smaller. So with high NA, so what's that NA stuff? Basically, in the past, we had stuff like this. So there was air in between the lens and the wafer. And then you can see not all the light is nicely focused here. Then some colleagues thought like, hey, let's put water in between and found out, OK, water makes sure that there is more focus. So that's on the right. So that's what something we already do for years, but it's to illustrate what that NA stuff is. So towards the future, and we actually already shipped the first machines uh, to Intel where they're doing tests, but it will take a while before you get them. Um, we will have even bigger mirrors uh, and even smoother mirrors. W these mirrors, like the previous generation, one mirror was about 123 kilograms. The new ones are more than 1,000 kilograms. So while the things that we print become smaller and smaller, the size of the machine basically becomes way bigger with each generation, uh, with a lot of extra challenges, of course. And here you can see basically left the old, right the new one. So they are way quicker, basically. And here you can actually see the new, uh, new and old reticles. So on the right, you see the new reticles, uh, the reticle handler. I thought it was one of these funny movies, right, where at the end it completely explodes. It's apparently, this runs 24-7, day after day. Uh, this is 32 Gs. So insanely fast where it goes uh, up and down. Uh, and keep in mind that still, uh, so that reticle is 32 Gs, that wafer is also faster. It still needs to sync somehow because that pattern needs to be printed well. So that's uh, quite a challenge. Um, so one of the other things that we get more and more towards the future is more and more measurements because software is becoming more and more important. Already, nowadays, without software, you cannot produce chips. You need software to create any chip. Uh, but we need more and more software to produce better and more uh, functioning chips, basically. We get billions of measurements, basically, that we try to uh, use to recalibrate the machine. So that's uh, that what we use to, to, for our customers, the number of wafers per day and the number of functioning chips per wafer, those are the most important criteria that they have. And we use software to realize that. Um, and because if you look at it, uh, we, we try to create an environment that is as good as possible to create these chips. Uh, for example, 
the cleanliness of these factories, it's, it's crazy. So uh, chip manufacturers, 10 particles a cubic meter. Americans, they're a bit dirty, right? Uh, but of, of course, probably they don't need it. For us, uh, really small things can already break some stuff. So let's imagine that we print one layer and we look that layer from the side. Uh, I don't have really good uh, drawing skills, but uh, yeah, I think this is clear, right? We print the second layer and it's a little bit off. This is something which you try to prevent, right? Because if this continues, it might actually happen that the entire stuff falls over and then you have a chip that no longer functions. You could actually print lines next to each other, which is even worse, or short circuit them. So there are a lot of different issues that we can have. And um, it's even a, to, to give you an example of how critical it is, in, in these factories, you cannot wear perfume because perfume particles result in defects in chips. So small are the things that already break stuff. Really small dust or other particles can already result in, um, if it's on the wafer, that one or more chips isn't functioning. If that same particle is on the reticle, then each wafer that is passing through will have the same issues. Uh, so there are different ways uh, where you can have issues. There are ways to work around it. Let's imagine you have a memory chip, which is 32 uh, gigabytes, and we detect that uh, there is a part that's not working properly. Then depending on the design of the chip, they could disable half of the chip and sell it as a 16 gigabyte chip and still make some money of it. So it's not that it's completely lost, but of course the customer rather sells it as a 32 gigabyte chip because they make more money with it. Um, and we measure in, in different areas. One is a critical dimension that's uh, within a layer and overlay is position related. So what we saw before with the layers not nicely aligning, that's what we call overlay. We have some different machines to measure these kind of things because you can't really put it under a microscope or use a default camera. These we measure stuff on nanometer or even picometer, which is even one scale below uh, size. And that's, uh, yeah, you need special equipment for that. And we have two types uh, for that, but let's show a quick video of how it can work. So again, we have this FOOP with 20 wafers, and uh, this is one of the machines where we measure stuff. What you see here is that we basically um, send beams, uh, light beams of different colors to the wafer and then we measure the diffraction of those light beams. And based on that we can calculate uh, if the layers are nicely aligned or not. Uh, so we have all kinds of advanced algorithms to figure these things out. And um, like this we, we have a lot of measurements. So 31 terabytes per machine and keep in mind our customers have many of these machines. Um, we measure a lot of things. And then we use those measurements to basically correct one of the parameters inside the machine to make sure that the next time we print stuff, it goes better. Uh, so how does it work? For example, this, uh, they call it a mirror. I found it always a weird description. It's actually more than 4,000 mirrors and they can control each of them individually. So if something is, is wrong, we can adjust this one with like a nanometer or even a picometer level uh, to make sure that the reflection of the light is better. Uh, because, for example, if the machine heats up with all the, the warm that we have, stuff might already deviate. And then, uh, basically, you, you have something like this. So at the top, you see the various machines that we have. We looked at the lithography machine. That's basically the printing uh, machine that we saw before that creates the layers. Metrology is the measuring, which we saw before with the different colors of light being reflected. And we collect all that information inside a platform, which we call uh, the VCP platform, from all the different uh, machines. And then we can uh, see what to do with that information. And there is a, an, an added challenge here, because a lot of the algorithms that we have are either patented or even so secret that they don't want to patent it, because then after a while uh, it's still public. Um, so we don't really want to share that. On the other hand, our customers, they have data from those machines, which is basically their business and they also don't want to share that data. So a lot of this stuff or all of the stuff runs on-premise at customer sites. So customers have huge uh, server warehouses where uh, our software is running. So some of the software runs on the machine, but the application that my team is building uh, runs on one of these. And it's, it's huge machines. It's not the normal servers that you may have seen. These have hundreds of CPUs and hundreds of gigabytes of memory. Um, and we created a new platform on top of that because in the past, uh, each department 
like for example the measuring of the diffraction of the light that's a separate department and like that we have a lot of different departments they all have their own software and customers support our colleagues that work at the customer side to see what goes wrong and try to improve the machines needed to use all those different applications that all look differently and also didn't really perform well so a couple of years ago we actually started to create a new platform which then all the departments can create plugins on top of it uh, so we have to support things like high volume but it should be generic so some things like each wafer has an id each machine has an id that's generic for all the measurements but if you look at the measurements that we get those can be completely different so some can be just plain text data uh, but we can also get images or videos or anything basically uh, uh, can be used in the platform uh, so it's like a train platform uh, you have one platform where you can have fast trains, slow trains, long trains, short trains, whatever you want. Um, and, and for technology-wise, I'll give a bit of an overview. I won't dive deep. Um, but we use Apache Spark. Um, but basically, Apache Spark allows you to have multiple machines. And then you have one central machine that sends the uh, different uh, algorithms and data that needs to be processed to those multiple machines to parallelize the work. So it's a way to easily parallelize work and then retrieve the results back on the, the main machine, the driver. Uh, on top of that, we have three kinds of plugins. We have data plugins, which are used to inject the data inside our platform. We have UI plugins where we can customize the UI. We can, for instance, say which kind of plots we want to have, or tables, or graphs, or bars, or whatever you want to have. Uh, and from that UI also the processing plugins are triggered. So the processing plugins, they do the calculations on top of the data to calculate what's, what's going wrong or what's going good. A um, bit more detailed, it looks like this. So we have a data store, lots of data. Uh, we have a nice uh, front end. We also expect to have some jobs in the near future that run a headless without a UI. Uh, and they all use that same uh, Spark solution. Bunch of tools and libraries. How many people here do Java stuff? Few. So this is basically w what we are using. Um, I I'm always a bit resistant with this because you hear a lot of talks at conferences about cool stuff and then people start to use that in their project. Really be careful, only pick the stuff that really makes sense in your application. We didn't start with this. I mean, for example, we d in the beginning we just had REST communication. Later we added uh, Kafka for messaging uh, and streaming data. Uh, same for Graal VM, it was added way later in the project. So we just pick whatever is useful for our case. Uh, don't pick stuff because everyone at a conference talks about it. Unless it's cool, of course. And then we, uh, so the platform is completely Java based and of course a little bit Scala because uh, Spark is written in Scala. But we actually support many languages. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, we have those processing plugins and they can actually interact with different languages. Uh, such as, for example, Julia, Python, or whatever you want. And we have some different ways to do that, for example, via JNI uh, or via containers with which we communicate. Uh, so that way, basically, a lot of our colleagues, they are mathematicians, physicists, they write stuff in lower level languages. Uh, some of that stuff is actually also running on the machine, and we don't want them to rewrite everything in Java. So this way we can sort of wrap it in a little bit of Java code, but they can still reuse most of the stuff uh, which they created before. And because nowadays every talk needs something about machine learning, right? I also added something. Uh, and I, I actually think this is, this is a nice uh, example instead of uh, generating some text or something like that. Um, so some of our colleagues, they uh, created scans of the different uh, chips. And with those scans, they were able to uh, capture defects at almost 70%. If we would slow down those scans with uh, eight times, we get better results and we can capture 100% of the defaults. But that means basically then the scanning becomes a bottleneck because yeah, it's really slow now. So probably we can only scan one out of eight wafers now, which is a bit of a shame because then we maybe miss stuff, right? That's also not what you want. It's a bit of a trade-off. Uh, and then colleagues used uh, deep learning basically. Uh, on top of the normal one with, with the same speed and they were able to detect almost 93% of the cases. So that way we can still measure as many wafers as we did before and capture quite a bit of the defects. So this is one of the uh, examples that you could do. And then 
it ends up in this. So this is the, the uh, application. Probably when you look at it, you're like, what the heck am I looking at? At least that's what I had when I uh, first looked at it. Um, so to uh, s explain it a little bit, let's see here. We have CE, that stands for correctable errors. And here we see that all the arrows point in the same direction, like this. That basically means there is a bit of a deviation, two layers, one layer is a bit too far this way. So maybe next layer or the next wafer, we can print it a little bit this way. We know what to correct, that's a correctable error. Here we see non-correctable errors, or NCE. Here basically, errors go in all directions. So if we fix one arrow, the other arrow basically gets worse. So we don't know what to do with this. If we use even more advanced algorithms or really experienced colleagues, they might be able to uh, extract some correctable errors again from this one so that we can fix those. Uh, but for now, we, we can't fix that yet. And here you see, for example, uh, at the left, you see uh, this is the processing plugin that's being triggered. Uh, so this is the algorithm that's being executed on top of the data and on the right you see the visualization of that data and yeah, we can use all kinds of different plots and bars as you can already see on the right so this is on a yeah, high level how the application looks like any questions yeah the question is how are the reticles manufactured um, that's a good question, we don't do that. <laughs> uh, now the, the funny thing is that we create, yeah, you saw that loop with, and with the different machines that are being used. We create about two machines out of that entire set. We create the machines that are used to print on the wafers and we create the machines to measure if a wafer is correct. Um, creating the wafers, so the, the plain wafer that goes in the machine is done by another company. Creating reticles is also done by another company. So I'm not exactly sure how they, uh, they create them. Uh, and with a lot of these things, you can Google for it, you can find some information on a lot of these topics, but yeah, keep in mind a lot is also quite secret, so there's sometimes they don't share the details, but uh, the, the high level, how stuff works, you can actually find quite some videos on YouTube if you're interested. Good question. Uh, that's a, so the question is, uh, let's say our customer says they go to uh, smaller uh, transistors, new, uh, lower nanometers. Uh, how much do they influence it and how much do we influence it as, as uh, machine manufacturers, right? That was the question. Um, let's say it this way, if we don't create the machines, they can do it. Uh, you need the machines to go f uh, slower, uh, smaller and smaller. And, and the funny thing is we actually, for the latest generation, we don't have competition. So at this point in time, our company is the only one still supporting uh, going smaller and smaller. Um, without it, it's not possible, but still, they need to redesign their chips. They also sometimes do tricks, like uh, create a chip and then create another chip and then pasting them together to also improve stuff. So they also do a lot of improvements in that area. And there is actually, in, in Belgium, there is like a research institute which does a lot of innovation on that part. And there, a lot of these companies actually uh, participate in and they combine their knowledge. So some of the knowledge is company specific, but there are also initiatives where they collaborate on the next generation of chips. So yeah, for me it would be hard to say like we spend 40% in the improvements and they 60%. I think both parties spend a lot of time and effort in, in improving these things. Um, uh, to make it concrete, we now spend 4 billion a year on research on going to next generations of machines. So yeah, that's an insane amount of money, and that's only in our company. There are a lot of companies involved. Any other question? <laughs> so, yeah, the, the question is, how long does it take until you reach the physical limit? Yeah, I thought we would already have reached it. <laughs> there are some people that still think our machines uh, contain a wizard inside it uh, to do some stuff. Because um, people already said w when we did the EUV stuff that was sort of proposed by a professor in the US, most companies thought it wouldn't be possible. So our competition, they didn't even try. They thought it wouldn't be possible and would cost too much money. Um, we did and we spent more than 10 years creating those machines before they became uh, commercially available. Um, 
so yeah so far we still managed to go smaller and smaller but yeah as you saw in the, the nanometer scale overview you we reached the atom range so yeah what more can you do then so i don't know how long it will take but we still keep on improving and i i know there are new generations coming up so we can go even smaller than the stuff you have now but for how long no one knows i think at the back you also had a question right Yeah, so basically the question is how do we deal with open source and setting up everything and making sure stuff is secure. Um, so we, we use a lot of open source like I, I showed in the diagram. We try to use as much as possible from what's available in the market because that wa works way more efficient than doing everything in-house. Uh, but setting up the environment, so we, don't, we use some cloud environments but only for testing purposes. All the other stuff is like custom clusters created. Uh, and maintained by, by our colleagues. So that's a way how we protect it. And at customer side, most of the stuff I think isn't even connected to the internet. So we can't even access the machines of our customers from our office. Uh, someone needs to go there, needs all kinds of permissions to even access the machines, even to retrieve logs. There are, there are all kinds of processes. So um, yeah, there are a lot of ways uh, that it's basically from network level already cut off uh, from the rest of the world. Um, uh, because yeah, it, it's, it's a real threat. We have competition that tries to get that information and the same goes for our customers. Uh, so we all try our best to yeah, find security risks, make sure that everything is uh, uh, secured and that yeah, there's nothing open that doesn't need to be open, yeah. Any other questions? Then thank you all for joining and have a great rest of the day.